Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars, nothing but Star Wars all day long. Brum, 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 Star Wars. I'm losing my mind now because some Star Wars fans are absolute shit. So today's article review, we're going to be covering a Star Wars article from 80skids.com. 20 Reasons Why the Empire Were Actually the Good Guys of Star Wars by Rhiannon Sky Bowden. Ooh, we have our first female reactionary shitstain author. And she has no biography. She had no life before writing this absolute trash fire. She just popped into our universe to write it and then she disappeared back into the Q continuum. I'm not reading it off the website. It's too frustrating to read on the website because there's all these huge pictures that break up the text. So I copied it all into a Google Doc. On the face of it, Star Wars seems like a pretty traditional story of good versus evil. Where the heroes get the girl, the galaxy is saved, and the brave rebels get to ride off into the sunset when all is said and done. That's an understandable assumption given that the bad guys carry red laser swords and kill people with lightning that shoots out of their fingers. But there's actually a whole level of nuance that many fans are missing. What if the rebels aren't actually fighting for truth and justice across the galaxy? What if instead they're making everything worse? What if the evil regime they're so desperate to pull down is actually just a logical and efficient model of government? And the only way to successfully bring peace and safety to a galaxy filled with numerous planets that all have independent ecosystems, inhabitants, and lifestyles. Today, we're examining the idea that the Empire were actually the good guys of Star Wars. And it holds up better than you might expect. Um, spoiler alert, it doesn't hold up very well. For those of you who are familiar with the plot, I should not have to explain to you why the Empire were bad guys, okay? First of all, all Empires are bastards. A yab. The whole purpose of an Empire is the ruling class of one country going and asserting domination over the people of a different country, or in this case, planets, one planet over other planets. But besides the name, the Empire does plenty of pretty brutal things throughout the plot. First of all, they blow up Alderaan, okay? So they commit mass genocide on screen. If every single thing that the Empire did was good, before and after blowing up Alderaan, that alone would still be enough to write them off as irredeemably evil. The Empire is cancelled. They send their stormtroopers to kill Luke's family. We do get scenes of stormtroopers harassing and intimidating Empire citizens, which is, you know, what happens in a police state. ACAB most definitely applies to stormtroopers, they're racist. They live in this super diverse galaxy filled with thousands, if not millions, of sentient species. And yet everybody who's in the upper tiers of the military is a white human. Whereas the rebels collaborate with all sorts of different other types of people for their shared fight for liberation. Okay? The Empire are bad guys. If you think that's up for debate... Um, please go home and rethink your life. What was that line from Attack of the Clones? You wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't want to sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life? I want to go home and rethink my life. <laughs> you don't want to succumb to fascism. You want to go home and rethink your life. Of course, there always is the possibility that this is supposed to be satire that she's actually writing this as a way to highlight how bad the Empire actually is, as some form of political commentary. But if it is satire, it's not very good satire. 
usually with good satire, you can tell it's satire. And you can tell what ideological stance the author actually is taking. When we consider the fact that there are actually a large number of people in the English-speaking world who do actually think like this, and judging by the way this text is written, I'm thinking it's not satire. Alright, so let's dive into this article here. Reason number 20, the Republic wasn't working. Every Star Wars fan is expected to accept that the Empire just doesn't work as a form of government. But when you look at the prequels trilogy, it's pretty obvious that what came before wasn't much better. And you know what? I'm gonna agree with this. The Republic was experiencing a major crisis. But we have to be very careful with this term, work. Does it work? People are like, socialism doesn't work. Well, what do you mean by work? Do you mean that it maintains political stability and the economy functions smoothly? And you know, to right-wing chuds, the only people whose material interests matter are the bourgeoisie and socialism sure as fuck does not work for them. But it's not supposed to work for them. The Republic might have been functional once upon a time, but if it was, we never get to see it that way. Episodes 1 through 3 instead only show how it is full of competing factions and too big to fail. Maybe the most compelling evidence for this is that when the Trade Federation first becomes a threat, flagrantly breaking laws and creating an intimidatingly powerful alliance, all the Republic can do is call for an inquiry. Democracy moves so slowly under the Republic that it essentially makes no difference, leaving the Republic wide open to basically destroy itself. The strength of the Empire, meanwhile, is, is that they are centralized and can move swiftly to end smaller conflicts within the galaxy. Basically, she's laying out the logic of Bonapartism here. You know, the government as it currently exists is facing a crisis that it cannot solve in its current form. And so the only solution that the ruling class has is to change the form of government. And usually what happens is they place their trust in a Bonapartist dictator. Democracy moves so slowly under the Republic. Ugh, democracy moving slowly. We socialists would argue that these crises are not evidence that democracy doesn't work. When a capitalist system experiences a crisis, the cause of the crisis is not that the ruling class is using the wrong form of government. The problem is that the ruling class exists. Changing bourgeois democracy into a bourgeois Bonapartist dictatorship isn't going to solve the problem, because the problem comes from the inherent dysfunctionality of capitalism. The ruling class has demonstrated through this crisis that they are incapable of wielding power in a responsible way, due to the inherent conflicts and contradictions within capitalism itself. Things that we'll talk about perhaps in a different video. So the solution isn't to get rid of democracy. The solution is more democracy. If the working class is in power, that means that the people making the decisions and the people who are affected by the decisions and who do the work of putting those decisions into action are all the same people. It removes a major contradiction. Democracy moves so slowly. Shut the fuck up. And she also talks about how the empire is centralized. Radical democracy and centralization are not really incompatible things. So you can have a centralized government, you can even have a centrally planned economy, but it can still be under the total control of the greater public, as long as the people who are making the decisions in the center are themselves democratically elected and strictly accountable to the electorate. In my organization, we practice something called democratic centralism. And the term democratic centralism refers to how to organize a political organization, not a government. But there's no reason the principle would not be applicable to government. Basically what it is, is we have a party leadership, you know, a central committee, and they make the major decisions. However, this central committee is elected by all of the party members 
and they are subject to potential recall at any point. We do have debates and everybody is allowed to have their input, but after the vote takes place, then everybody has to go along with it. Having a central committee, having people with a certain amount of vested authority, they can make decisions quickly, which allows us to respond quickly to whatever happens that we need to respond to. This is something that the anarchists would disagree with. You know, they see authoritarianism and centrality as being one and the same, but I think that's a little bit silly. The Jedi were no longer doing their jobs. Instead of any kind of large-scale army, maybe made up of the forces of each member state, pre-Empire Republic instead relied on the Jedi Council to keep peace. Okay, I'm gonna debate that. Um, I'm pretty sure the Republic did have a standing army. They were the effing clones. They had a whole massive, massive infantry of clones. And I'm assuming that before the clones, they had some other type of army. I think the Jedi were just supposed to be like the special ops shock troops. They weren't the entire police and military, I don't think. Even at the height of their power, these lightsaber-wielding space wizards numbered only in the thousands, meaning they couldn't possibly be everywhere they needed to be in order to solve crime and keep chaos from breaking out across the galaxy. Not only that, but in the prequels, even the Jedi admit that their powers are diminished and failing, and that they cannot promise to keep the galaxy entirely safe. Their weakened connection to the Force means that they fail to notice the dark side's rise to prominence, and when pursuing justice, they are just as likely to prioritize murder over a fair trial as the Sith. It's also arguably the Jedi Order that led to the power of the Sith, due to the fact that the more the Jedi trained, the more powerful the Sith became to balance it out. Listen to all of this, like, law and order rhetoric that she's using here. You know, they were there to prevent chaos and fight crime. You know, her idea of safety is, you know, the state's armed bodies of men being able to go wherever and inflict large amounts of violence on people who step out of line. You know, safety for whom? That's the question I want to ask. Because, you know, the police and military, and I'm going to count the Jedi among them, they are not capable of keeping people safe. Okay? They're not. And the reason is because they're usually the danger, not the protection from the danger. For example, say for a black man from the inner city who gets stopped and frisked every five minutes, who gets sent to jail over possessing small amounts of recreational drugs, how are the cops keeping him safe? When one out of three black men in the United States are thrown into prison, how is that protecting them from chaos? Oh god, this one is rich. The Empire is a meritocracy. Many of the protagonists of Star Wars are people who came from nothing, whether that's a literal child slave like Anakin or a humble moisture farmer like Luke. Both of these characters long to get away from the drudgery of their life and pursue something greater, and it is suggested that the rebels will provide them with both opportunities and a family. In fact, it's actually the Empire who are more likely to give them a purpose in life. The galaxy is littered with training academies designed by the Empire to reward hard work and promote advancement, with even Han Solo getting his start at one after escaping his former life. Even when Han Solo becomes the, an enemy of the Empire, his contribution to it does not go unrecognized, with his enemies still referring to him as captain to recognize his role in the Imperial Starfleet. The problem with a meritocracy is that it's still an ocracy at the end of the day. You know, just because somebody is unusually clever or unusually creative or hardworking or self-sacrificing, that doesn't make it logical to give them large amounts of authority over other people. You know, other people, even really, really smart people, are not necessarily capable of making good decisions on your behalf. Therefore, the only way to ensure a system that works well for everybody is for everybody to have an equal say in the decisions that are made. 
and hierarchies, even meritocratic ones, are not necessarily a good thing. And also, she's talking about giving them a purpose in life, giving them something to achieve, something to contribute. Okay, having a purpose in life, or achieving something, or succeeding, or contributing, those things are not in and of themselves good. It matters what your purpose is, what you're achieving, what you're contributing to. And if your purpose is supporting this nasty, violent police state, it's a shitty purpose, and you are a shitty person for making it your purpose. It is better to achieve absolutely nothing in your life and never hurt anyone than to work really hard and succeed a lot at something that harms other people, okay? They ended the chaos of the Clone Wars. Maybe the biggest point in the Republic's favor is that it was able to boast maintaining peace, frequently referring to a period of prosperity that lasted for a hundred years. That calm climate promoted self-interest and complacency, leaving the planets to be run by bureaucrats more interested in maintaining their own position than actively making life better for their citizens. Okay, the problem with bureaucrats, the solution to that problem is not less democracy, it's more democracy. You know, if we want a government that makes decisions on behalf of regular people, it needs to be run by regular people who have absolute total control over it. Everyone is elected, everyone is subject to potential recall at any time, and everyone is paid no more than the average worker's wages. On the other side of things, the Empire manages to contain and bring an end to one of the most devastating conflicts the galaxy has ever seen, one that both the Jedi and the Republic fail to resolve. Again, explaining the logic of Bonapartism. Throughout the whole of the Clone Wars, the Republic was forced to fight defensively and deal with the Separatists on their own terms, whereas the might of the Empire ensured that such a large-scale coup was unlikely to happen ever again. Not only that, but the Empire makes a concentrated effort to placate the Separatists, thus getting rid of the root causes of the Clone Wars. Um, no, the root cause of the Clone Wars was capitalism. If I remember correctly, the Separatists were literally led by a group of people called the Trade Federation, okay? They weren't fighting over high-minded ideals. They were fighting over very concrete material economic and political interests. There was a segment of the ruling class in the area that was trying to separate that felt that the Republic government was not adequately serving their needs and so they desired to break off and have their own little bourgeois state. I could go off on a tangent here and talk about the national question. The only people who should be making decisions about separation within the separatist area are the working class of that region. And by placate the separatists, she means placate the ruling class of that particular area. The Trade Federation was becoming too powerful. Speaking of the Clone Wars, even the discontent that fueled it was made worse by the Republic, who failed to realize just how powerful the corporate interests of the galaxy were. Instead of making the connection that ruthless taxation could lead to discontent and actively involve them in dialogue to reach a compromise, the Republic shunning of the Outer Rim only made the Separatists believe that war was the only option. Meanwhile, the Empire made sure that, that the corporate sector of the galaxy was happy by ensuring that the economy was serving them and that they were given good contracts and enough FREEDOM! At the same time, the Empire stopped the corporate interests from ever eclipsing the government's own power, both legally and militarily. Not only did this prevent anybody from getting too powerful and undermining the Empire, but it also encouraged competition by ensuring that it would be rewarded. There's a lot of her ideology that's coming out in this particular section right here. First of all, if the problem is that the corporations are getting too powerful and are causing a conflict, the solution isn't to placate the corporations. The solution is to get rid of the corporations and put power in the hands of the working class. And she's also explaining Bonapartism even more. The role of a Bonapartist government is to solve problems on behalf of the ruling class 
but not necessarily giving the ruling class control of the government. She's saying that that's literally what happened with the empire. And these code words like freedom and competition and low taxes, those are words for allowing the capitalists to do whatever the flying fuck they want, usually at the expense of regular people. To a reactionary, the only people's interests who matter are the interests of the bourgeoisie. Oh god. (laughs) They boosted the galactic economy. After the Clone Wars, the Empire immediately set about giving normal working people a focus again, while stopping the galaxy from falling into chaos. There's that word again, chaos. You know, that law and order rhetoric that is the heart and soul of reactionary ideology. Due to the void that the Trade Federation left, the Empire did this by seizing the assets of those no longer operating companies that had backed the Confederacy. Wait, this is... this is confusing. Does she mean no longer operating as in the businesses were no longer operating with a dash between the words and no longer operating? Or does she mean people who were not operating companies? So they were operating those companies before and somebody else was operating these companies. Okay, whatever. Not the worst bit of writing that we've seen in a reactionary article before. By seizing the assets of those no longer operating companies that had backed the Confederacy and creating cooperatives that employed more people, distributed wealth more efficiently, and kick-started the manufacturing industry. Here's the thing. We don't need corporations to create jobs for us, okay? There's plenty of work to be done all over everywhere. What we're missing is the resources and the tools to go about that work. You know, if we simply dethroned the ruling class and took the means of production for ourselves, we could give everyone a guaranteed job and we wouldn't have to worry about where their wages would come from because nobody is making a profit off of that work. You know, the money isn't just mysteriously disappearing into the void. That is the 1%'s bank accounts. Almost all Empire ships and weapons were created by these new companies, which included Cout Drive Yards, Sinar Fleet Systems, the Tage Co., Mega Corporation, and Mursan Munitions. Ugh, goddamn. There is nothing in the world more disgusting than an arms manufacturing corporation. And she's talking, we're gonna give people jobs. Building terrible super weapons. This created (coughs) countless jobs that brought wealth to new sectors and planets. While giving everybody an opportunity to take part and advance if they wished. Ugh. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I want to die. This approach to boosting the economy might explain why many citizens... (laughs) Why many many citizens seem uh, happy (laughs) under imperial rule (laughs) as they personally saw an uptick in their quality of life. (laughs) Seem... Personally saw an uptick in their quality of life. (laughs) <laughs> Bitch, where? Not on Tatooine. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is gonna hurt to read. The Empire isn't as brutal as it seems. Um, you mean Sema? The most memorable evil act that the Empire commits is obviously their destruction of Alderaan. A choice so completely ruthless, it's almost impossible to justify. Almost. (laughs) Oh my god. She's literally an apologist for genocide at this point. You know what? While fascism as a political phenomenon only really occurs under certain circumstances and under certain patterns, there's also the ideology of fascism. Which is kind of a separate thing. Rhiannon is a fascist, okay? You know, she probably doesn't think of herself as a fascist. She might not even think of herself as a right-winger. But 
this is fascism, okay? This is the ideology of fascism manifested in article form. I, I keep expecting all of the words to jump out of my screen and like lump together to form the shape of a person and then it will just like stick out its hand in a Nazi salute. Almost. The reason it seems so completely indefensible is that Leia herself says the planet is peaceful, harboring no weapons, no secret rebellion, and no intention to face off against the Empire. No, the reason it's indefensible is because billions of innocent people live there, okay? It doesn't matter what else is on the planet. Like, are you saying that it's okay to bomb the absolute living crap out of North Korea just because they have nuclear weapons? The reason that North Korea went through the trouble to develop nuclear weapons in the first place is because, you know, one time America invaded them and killed 10 to 20 percent of their population and they want to make sure it never happens again. Ugh, I want to die. Actually, no, I don't want to die. I want to live so that I can fight this fascism. If I do die, I want it to be in the fight against fascism. Well, I know I'm going to die eventually, probably of cancer like everybody else, but... Everything Leia says whilst in Imperial captivity is a lie, from saying she is on a diplomatic mission whilst actually actively spying, to falsifying information about where the rebels are based. It is not unreasonable to assume that Alderaan actually is armed and dangerous, and does have intent to act violently against the Empire. In fact, given Leia's high status and personal stake in the Rebellion, it actually makes more sense the planet would somehow be involved. Again, like, why does that matter? Oh my god, I'm so mad right now. This is off the fucking rails. This is honestly way worse than anything we saw in the articles by Paul Kanger or Peter Buttfind or whatever that other guy was who wrote that other article. This is actual genocide apologia. And the worst part is, there are actually Americans who think it would be justified to bomb the crap out of North Korea and kill everyone who lives there just because they have nuclear weapons, and that's what's scary to me. Life under the Empire could actually be pretty fun. Even if you admit- <laughs> Even if you admit Van- <laughs> Even if you can admit Van, many of the Empire's decisions are totally logical. <laughs> A fascist who cannot proofread. Look, I'm not going to pretend that I'm, like, grammatically perfect, that I've never published anything important that had a typo in it, because I have on this channel. I even made a video about it. But I'm sorry, this is just low-hanging fruit, and I'm gonna fucking pick it and eat it. <laughs> Van. She's a Nazi, but she sure as fuck ain't a grammar Nazi. That would definitely be a point against them, if true. But there's actually not much indication that it is. Though the military is pretty strictly regimented, that's actually the case under most regimes, no matter the planet or even the system of government. But... Those who choose to join up and fight are probably attracted to order and discipline, but there are career paths for those who prefer a more laid-back approach to life, too. First of all, how does she know that everybody who's in the military, in the Empire, is actually choosing to be there? Because, you know, the clones sure as fuck didn't choose to be there. Finn, when he was kidnapped, drafted into the military as a baby... He sure as fuck didn't choose to be there. In fact, for most citizens of the galaxy, life was pretty similar under both the Republic and the Empire. I mean, that tends to happen, you know? It was a capitalist galactic state before, and it was a capitalist galactic state afterwards, with all of the barbarism that entails. Most people were left to do their jobs and then spend their free time however they wanted, going to clubs and bars, playing card games, attending concerts, and even seeing bands like the Emperor's New Clothes. In fact, the galaxy's most beloved sport 
Wag Sphere, which was developed under the Empire, even became its official sport. Low gravity football, if you're wondering. I mean, but this is the case of, like, most authoritarian regimes. If you were to go to, I don't know, China, which is pretty authoritarian, there's still people having fun and living their lives in China. You can watch all these fun videos of things made by Chinese artists and not even political debate and philosophical debate stops under authoritarianism. They just have to be careful about how they do it. It's kind of like this idea that we have in the United States where people say, oh, America is kind of fucked up, you know, capitalism is kind of fucked up. And some shit stain will come out of the word work to say, well, actually, if you go to the grocery store, you have this wide choice of consumer goods and you're using an iPhone. First of all, there's no reason why we can't have those things in a socialist economy. And second of all, having a large choice of consumer goods to buy isn't the same as having a guarantee of a roof over your head, a guarantee of access to health care and education. It's not the same thing as being guaranteed that you'll have a job to go to with a steady living wage. I hate this woman so much, okay? I just hate her so much. I should write her a strongly worded letter. I'm so tired. I don't want to read the other ones. Whatever. Even Palpatine wasn't totally evil. It takes a while to come around to the idea that the Empire isn't unambiguously evil, but even once you do, it's hard to accept that Palpatine isn't just a one-dimensional bad guy. The dude has unnatural eyes and skin so gray it cannot be human, and he walks around under a black cloak, croaking like a crazy old wizard. Surely there's nothing good about him. It's not quite that simple. Um, excuse me, don't you mean it's not quite than simple? Palpatine's ambition from the beginning was to create a government system less prone to squabbling and infighting that could wreck progress. <laughs> that could wreck progress. That could wreck. That could wreck progress and stunt ambition. Something that he definitely achieved. However, he also had contingency plans to protect the people of the galaxy from future threats, ones that the Jedi couldn't see and which the Republic couldn't possibly fight. So once again, she's laying out the logic of Bonapartism. Palpatine was put in power to solve a crisis on behalf of the ruling class, and he did. But that doesn't make him a good guy. You know, the reason that the capitalist ruling class is having crises is because they exist. The solution to these crises, the permanent solution, the only thing capable of making sure they never return, is to overthrow the ruling class and put power in the hands of people who do the actual work. He had contingency plans to protect the galaxy from future threats. No, he doesn't. How can he and his police state protect people from threats when they themselves are the threats? It's like when people say, oh, the troops protect our freedom. The cops keep us safe. No, they don't. They are the main threats to our freedom. The Yuzhan Vong are a contingent of ruthless cultists committed to destruction with technology so advanced that it's immune to the Force. Though Palpatine was deposed long before they arrived, he foresaw their arrival and made plans to protect his people. I'm assuming she's talking about something that came out of, like, the back hidey holes of Star Wars canon in the extended universe. And, you know, we have to think about, like, Who are these cultists? What sort of social forces brought them into existence? Because people like this don't just come out of nowhere. And everybody loves the government when it smashes up reactionary shit stains, like when all the capital rioters got arrested. But we also have to remember that the forces that are wielded against the right extremists are also one day going to be wielded against us leftists and ordinary people. There's no reason to think a socialist galaxy run by the working class would not be capable of dealing with this threat. In fact, had the contradictions of capitalism been removed, 
the various social conflicts and problems that encourage people to join this cult might not have existed. Their empire makes the galaxy safer. You know, this this is so stupid that I'm just not even going to read it. There's no progression as a Jedi. The Jedi are essentially the mythic heroes of the Star Wars universe, at least during the times where knowledge of them was common and accepted. There was no profession more idolized or revered than that of a Jedi Knight. However, not just anyone can be a Jedi. In fact, even a sky-high midi-chlorian count isn't enough to guarantee a position as a Jedi Master. The Jedi are such sticklers for the rules that many talented and force-sensitive people never got the opportunity to become Jedi, or were kept from becoming masters if they were allowed to train. They were either too old, or too emotional, or too willing to question tradition and authority when they grew up. This stops so many Jedi from ever reaching their potential, and the galaxy is no doubt less safe because of it. First of all, if you're this religious sect training people how to become deadly fighters, you want to be pretty selective about who you let into the club and who you let sit in positions of authority within that circle, okay? Second of all, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but are we necessarily sure that the Jedi are keeping people safe? Because they, like the clones, like the stormtroopers, are agents of the state. They're part of those armed bodies of men that Friedrich Engels talks about. And women, and non-binary people, and whatever the fuck these things are. I'm sorry, that was racist. I'm cancelled. And we see this in the movie. The Jedi, they're there to squash dissent against the government enforce the will of the bourgeois state. The Jedi High Council are part of the ruling class. And religion, as I think I've said many times before on this channel, is very much a tool that the ruling class uses to assert and justify its authority. So the fact that the armed thugs are religious kind of works out. And just because they talk about, you know, fighting for good and being noble doesn't mean they are. The best example of this is Anakin, who spends many years clearly showing that he is one of the most talented Force users the Jedi has ever encountered, during a time when their ability to use the Force was on the decline. That, plus his unorthodox viewpoint and approach, could have revitalized the Jedi, but instead, he was never offered the opportunity to become a master, thus solidifying his destiny to become a Sith. Why is Anakin deciding to join up with these Bonapartist shit stands the responsibility of the Jedi Council? You know, they're not responsible for Anakin's behavior. He's a grown ass man. <laughs> the Empire introduced universal currency. It's taken as an objectively bad thing that once the Empire is in control, it, they immediately set up a centralized government that controls even the furthest and most distant planets. Didn't the Republic also do that? However, this overlooks some of the clear benefits that a centralized government can bring, with the biggest high point no doubt being a centralized currency. Once again, I'm just gonna say, you know, having a centralized government isn't necessarily a bad thing. But it's only a good thing if that government is under very strict democratic control. A capitalist government is not capable of using that centralized authority in such a way to benefit regular people. The use of imperial credits across planets and even star systems means that certain civilizations don't see their economy crash thanks to a weak exchange rate and cannot be taken advantage of by stronger planets in terms of trade. Actually, the opposite of this is true. Um, take, for example, the European Union. So the European Union is all these different countries who all have the same currency. And in some ways, that's convenient. You can spend the same money in Germany that you spend in Greece. So if you're traveling around, you know, that makes your life easier. But also, First of all, it takes control of the currency away from the local government. So, for example, when Greece was having economic problems, you know, it's not allowed to print money. You know, sometimes governments, in order to solve certain economic problems, they can print money to do that. 
but Greece isn't allowed to do that, so it caused a bunch of problems. Second of all, the European Union is pretty exploitive. You know, there's this kind of imperialist or semi-imperialist parasitic relationship between the wealthy core countries like Germany and France and the poorer southern countries like, once again, Greece. This facilitation of international trade, and you know, trade in and of itself is not a bad thing, but capitalist free trade usually ends up with corporations coming in from the rich countries and then exploiting the ever-living fuck out of the poor countries, and we're seeing that in the European Union. Now, if this centralized currency was in the hands of the working class, a lot of those problems would be solved because I'll say it for the third time, just by allowing the people who do the work to carry out decisions and are affected by decisions to actually be the same people who make those decisions eliminates so much conflict and contradiction. It also means that the growth of the economy benefits everybody, and less profitable areas are buoyed up by the strength of the empire as a whole. Once again, real life shows that the opposite is true. Not to mention the fact that the same currency can be spent on any planets. On any planets. <laughs> Even if you accept Van, it's Sima. Not to mention the fact that the same currency can be spent on any planets means there's much more freedom to travel across the galaxy. Anyone can make their fortune anywhere and can save up to create a new life for themselves on a brand new planet if they really want to. That mobility only makes the empire stronger. You know, this stupid meritocratic bootstrap myth. The Jedi are accountable to no one. Despite being a religion, the Jedi hardly function as a bunch of sequestered monks, keeping their distance from the rest of the galaxy to focus on wisdom and contemplation. In reality, the Jedi actually function more like a special branch of the military, following the will of the government to bring about justice quote-unquote justice, using skills that nobody else has. That alone is already pretty frightening. There's no guarantee that every call the Republic makes in order to preserve peace by deploying the Jedi was actually the right one, and the power to command them could be hugely dangerous in the wrong hands. You know what? That is a hundred percent true. You know, the main problem with the bourgeois state is that even if it's quote-unquote democratic, it's still being run by a minoritarian ruling class who are not strictly accountable to the general public. When you elect the president of the United States, even though you voted for him and have the option to vote him out, you don't actually have any democratic way to punish him if he is acting in contrast to what he promised to do or doing things that are hurting the people. The only thing you can really do is just wait for four years to see if somebody else runs against him who's better. And, you know, more often than not, the person who runs against the president is just another sleazeball. However, the big problem is that the power the Jedi wield is so large they could have easily pressured the Republic and they would have no clear way to respond. The Jedi are not democratically elected. Nobody has any say over who is allowed to wield the Force and the process of choosing who is on the Jedi Council is even more obscure. If they wanted to have influence policy or even pressure the Republic to go to war, they would have the numbers and the power and the Jedi mind tricks to do so. All of this is legitimate criticism, but the heavy implication in this passage is that the Empire is somehow better. And you're like, where are you going with this, Rhiannon? How is an undemocratic system within a bourgeois quote-unquote democratic state somehow worse than having absolutely no democracy at all? You know, the stormtroopers also are completely and totally unaccountable to anyone except the emperor, who himself is unaccountable. Once again, I will say for the millionth time, the answer is more democracy, not less. She even uses the word democracy in here. Oh my god. <laughs> the Empire is full of people passionate about peace. 
It might sometimes seem like the Empire is full of mustache twirly bad guys, but that is mostly because the stories we are shown are told from the perspective of the Rebellion and the Republic. However, despite the Rebellion's insistence that everyone working in proximity to a stormtrooper is determined the ruling galaxy, most are just ordinary people living ordinary lives. <laughs> <laughs> She's this close to saying blue lives matter. <laughs> One Star Destroyer captain, known as Sienna Re, joined the Imperial forces because they thought it was the best way to see the world and look out for people, and was soon promoted after the Battle of Endor. As captain, Re went out of her way to prioritize saving civilians of the planets where clashes with the Rebellion were taking place even when not explicitly told to by her superiors. She also made sure to protect her fellow pilots and minimize destruction and disruption to the planet below, sticking with them even when all hope seemed lost. She's, like, using, like, the good apple fallacy. Yeah, Sienna Re, she was probably a nice, ordinary person who genuinely believed that she was doing the right thing, but social problems are not caused by bad individuals who have bad hearts. Social problems are caused by bad systems that incentivize bad behavior. You know, people love to point out the stories of, oh, a cop saved a kitten from a tree. But it doesn't really matter because, you know, what else is that cop doing? You know, what is Sienna Reed doing when she's fighting the rebels? Like... What is she there for? Just because she isn't a total dick in that situation doesn't mean she's fighting for the good guys. And again, she's talking about peace. It kind of harkens back to that law and order rhetoric. Peace for whom, okay? When Luke's family got blown up by the stormtroopers, was he living under peace? Or to bring it home, when some random civilian is gunned down by a cop within 10 seconds of the encounter, is that person experiencing peace? The Emperor does away with the clones. One of the biggest ethical sticking points in Star Wars is the morality behind certain kinds of troops and employees, whether it's droids or clones. At first glance, it seems like both the Empire and the Republic are equally reliant on clones for their forces. <laughs> which throws up a whole host of ethical questions about how much they actually value the people willing to die for the cause. And I guess, you know, I can say this for a million times, condemning the Empire is not necessarily an endorsement of the Republic. Rather than clone more troops and have an infinite army, the position of every second generation stormtrooper was filled by a human who volunteered to enlist and fight. Are the clones not human? I'm pretty sure they're human. I mean, they're clones, but they're not any other type of animal. This might seem like a weird choice, but it was the Emperor's personal preference. Even though the human stormtroopers were slower and more disobedient, he made a point of phasing out the clones as soon as possible. The reason for this is that the Emperor believed it was better to have a human workforce who could consent to work as part of the Imperial forces. I don't know, maybe she read this somewhere in the back alleys of the Star Wars canon, but I think the reason that he turned to clones is because it's cheaper to grab randos off the street than to have a whole science lab where you try to grow people in artificial wombs. Consent. You know, part of me really doesn't think that Emperor Palpatine cared that much about consent. The Empire brought about a technical revolution. Yeah, and the Nazis invented rocket science. That doesn't make the Nazis good guys. And it sure as fuck doesn't negate the possibility that some good people could have invented rocket science under different circumstances. Given that the Republic consisted of an outdated democratic system, <coughs> led by an old school monarchy, it's not an old school monarchy. Who is the monarch? Queen Amidala? I think she was just the Queen of Naboo and she was elected as queen. In fact, half of the power of the Trade Federation came from the fact that they were consistently pushing for innovation and advancement, and their anger came from feeling stifled by the somewhat old-school republic. 
the need for defense meant creating super weapons like the Death Star that had never been conceived of before, as well as other smaller weapons that could call on a supernova to wipe out a planet. How is that defense, okay? First of all, defense from whom? And who are we defending? You know, it's the same Orwellian doublespeak that the U.S. government says, calling it a Department of Defense when really it's just to go out and blow up weddings in school buses full of children. Also, the Empire's centralized approach to government means that they could invest in huge telecommunication networks so that each planet could keep in touch with its neighbors. Not only did that provide thousands of jobs, but it also facilitated more trade, as well as a safer galaxy. Bringing the planets together probably also fostered a much bigger feeling of community throughout the Empire. Oh my god. The government can't create a safer galaxy if it itself is doing unspeakable amounts of violence, nor can it bring about peace. Authoritarian structures and hierarchies are antithetical to community. When people are living under authoritarianism and are constantly at fear of their own survival, it makes it very difficult to have a sense of solidarity with the people around you. I know this from my own personal experience of being in authoritarian settings versus egalitarian settings. It's not possible for something like the Empire to bring about a sense of community. The Rebellion didn't have galaxy-wide support. When you first watch the original Star Wars trilogy, it's impossible not to root for the ragtop group of rebels trying to defend peace and justice against the Big Bad Empire. Um, yeah, because in the very first movie, you see them kill Luke's aunt and uncle. But have you ever wondered why they're so ragtag? Because they're primarily recruited from the galactic working class, and they don't have funding from major corporations or shit tons of taxpayer money. There are countless planets in the galaxy, and even more, countless amount of citizens on each planet, all of whom are apparently being crushed under the boot heel of the Empire. The question is, if the Empire is so terrible, why wouldn't more people come out in support of the rebels? It's understandable that many would be scared by the Imperial Force's immense power, but you'd think there'd still be more than a few dozen willing to risk it all for a better life. Not only that, but there are plenty of other ways to stand up to the Empire. Those planets who were too scared to actively fight could have funneled in resources, aiding the rebels with weapons, money, or general support. The fact that barely any planets were willing to help even indirectly implies that many were happy with the status quo and actively preferred it to the insurgent rebel forces. I mean, the ruling classes of those planets probably preferred it. It's a complicated question why more people don't rebel against their oppressors. So there's something called cultural hegemony, which I think I might have talked about before. Basically, the ideology of the ruling class and the justification for the ruling class's existence, because the ruling class has institutional power, they are able to make that ideology the dominant ideology. So most people are trained from birth to accept the authority of the ruling class. Also, you know, these people are trying to survive living under authoritarianism. Not everybody has the ability to go out and take major risks. You know, they have families and kids and a job. Also, working class people have a very rational desire to not pick fights that they know they can't win. So just because people are not rebelling doesn't necessarily mean that they're not oppressed. Also, do we really know from the Star Wars canon how much support there actually is from the rebels? We don't really get to meet and talk to a whole lot of random civilians across the galaxy to hear what they think about the rebellion. And a lot of people who don't join the rebellion may very well be supporters of it. The Rebellion probably also has cells and units in other places besides just the ones that Luke and Leia hang out with. And no, no Rebellion is going to have galaxy-wide support because the people who are part of the ruling class, they're not going to be too 
down for working class rebellion overthrowing the state that is protecting their interests. Of course, we never actually learn whether or not the Star Wars rebels are socialistic in nature if they're a working class movement and not just a liberal movement. George Lucas actually was inspired by communist rebellions like the Viet Cong when he was writing Star Wars, but I'm a death of the author kind of gal. Even if George Lucas didn't intend for the rebels to be communists, I'm just gonna go ahead and believe that they were communist anyway. Oh my god, I think this might be the worst one. No, justifying Alderaan was the worst one. The Empire coexists peacefully with aliens. There is no doubting the fact that the Empire is pretty human-centric, from the lines of marching stormtroopers to the almost all-human leadership. Contrast with the Rebellion and also the Republic, who seem to have more aliens on staff despite a pretty high percentage of humans. That might seem like a point against the Empire, but when you take into account which group actually coexists with alien populations, then things come out mostly in the Empire's favor. Unlike with the Republic and the Jedi, we never see the Empire attempt to mind trick an entire alien civilization, simply in order to bring them on side. See, the Gungans. Not only that, but when the Empire built their shield generator on a planet where there was an established colony of Ewoks, they were content to leave them to continue life as usual. It was only when the rebels showed up that the Ewoks had to deal with upheaval, chaos, and violence they didn't agree to. Oh my god, this one is awful. The Empire is human-centric because they're racists, okay? They're racist reactionaries. The Republic has a lot of aliens in it because, you know, marginalized people are attracted to working-class movements. Also, where is the Empire coexisting with the aliens? She mentions the Gungans. You know, just because the Republic and the Jedi were shitty, which I can believe they were, that's not a point in the Empire's favor. Because the Empire and the Republic are not really that different of entities. And also, how do we know that the Stormtroopers actually were getting along with the Ewoks? The Ewoks seemed pretty content to kick the Stormtroopers out. And you know, it's only when the Rebels showed up that the Ewoks had to deal with upheaval and chaos. This kind of maps onto like this outside agitator narrative you sometimes see. So for example, you know, a lot of people talk about how like the riots in like Black Lives Matter protests must have been started by people who weren't from the neighborhood, whether they be, you know, some anti-fa kid from a middle class neighborhood who drove into there, who who came from out of town or a cop or something because for some reason, a lot of people who are sympathetic with the ruling class can't wrap their mind around why people would want to rebel. You live under capitalism, everything is amazing, you have no problems. And so the only explanation they can think of is that somebody is tricking them into rebelling or inciting a rebellion unnaturally. That's why so many right-wingers are absolutely 100% convinced that George Soros must be funding Antifa, because they can't understand why people would choose on their own to put on masks and go beat up Nazis. They can't understand why people would gather in large groups to demand that the cops stop killing random civilians on the street. They don't have any concept of populist politics. Clearly, the rebels must have tricked the Ewoks, because they never would have just done it on their own. Oh my god. The morality of the Jedi creates villains. There's so much evidence of the fact that the Jedi Code inevitably leads to suffering that it's almost an article of its own. With that said, one key argument is that by creating a religion wherein feeling emotion is something to be feared and suppressed, villains like Darth Vader will always reoccur. There are several religions on Earth that emphasize detachment in order to allow for peace and clarity. None of them actively punish the idea of love and commitment. Not only that, but the Jedi create such a climate of fear and obedience that even when Anakin is uncertain of the path he should take, he doesn't feel like he can talk to his master about it. Without the unnecessary discipline of the Jedi Order, Anakin would never have felt abandoned by the only place he wanted to belong, and so never would have looked for answers elsewhere. 
he also wouldn't have been susceptible to manipulation by the Sith, as their offer to let him prioritize those he loved wouldn't have had any power over him. Once again, the shittiness of the Jedi Order is not the cause of Anakin deciding to ally himself with ultra-reactionary violent chuds. He chose to do that on his own. Second, once again, the badness of the Jedi and the Republic is not an argument toward the Empire's favor. You know, if we think about the Jedi, if we think about them as a religion, it doesn't really make a lot of sense why they discourage attachment and emotions and have this authoritarian fear-based climate within them. But if we remember that they are also, in fact, armed thugs of the bourgeois state, then it does make a lot of sense. The Jedi are an authoritarian institution because the role they play in society is an authoritarian one. Once again, religion is very much a tool that's used for social control and enforcement by the ruling class. You know, I'm not saying that's insult religious comrades, but even if you believe that your religion is true, you still have to admit the role that it plays in class-based society, the way it has been used historically to enforce a social hierarchy. The Rebellion sees alien species as expendable. We've already discussed the ways in which the Empire is better for the aliens of the galaxy than the Republic ever was, but it's actually worse than you might imagine. More than fighting wars on their planets and mind-tricking them to agree to aid and abet the Rebellion, um, citation needed, the Republic and Rebel groups they endorse actively made life dangerous and even deadly for alien races of the galaxy. Even when the rebels invaded the Ewoks' planet to further their agenda, the destruction of their home and upheaval of their routine was, was actually the least of their worries. Even the fact that many of them became civilian casualties wasn't the worst thing to come out of their interaction with the rebels. They were also conscripted to fight! Go back and watch the movie and look at the bloodlust in those Ewoks' eyes as they're taking down those stormtroopers, okay? The rebels expanded a huge amount of energy trying to convince the Ewoks to participate in the conflict, not out of any sense of moral duty, but simply because they didn't have enough manpower to win otherwise. The Ewoks, the reason it, okay, the reason why they had to spend a lot of energy to convince them is because they didn't even speak the same language. They were relying on C-3PO, who was not actually that good of a translator from the looks of it. The Ewoks wouldn't have agreed to it if they didn't already kind of want to kill the stormtroopers anyway. Once again, it's like that outside agitator narrative. Wait, is there a conclusion? She wrote this whole long-ass listicle and didn't include a conclusion. Like, come on, Rhiannon, are you just gonna leave me hanging there? Shitty ideology and even shittier writing. <sighs> I am so tired, okay? I'm just so tired. I think I say this at the end of every review I do, but I'm not gonna lie, I truly think that this one was the worst, was the shittiest, was the most misanthropic, was the most ass-backward, and fascistic. Ugh. Jesus H. Christ. Like, Star Wars, whether y'all like it or not, is a communist movie, okay? Um, otherwise, why would Luke be called Red Five? Oh, there's another color unit? Yeah, it's the gold color unit. Star Wars is a story about a multi-ethnic coalition of the oppressed banding together and kicking ass. Star Wars is communist, and if you disagree, you're wrong, and you can come to my house and fight me. And, like, you hear a lot of, like, dog whistles in this text, this article here, to various, like, right-wing quote-unquote libertarian talking points. It was good for the economy. They didn't tax the corporations more than they had to. They gave people jobs. 
Also, like, this law and order rhetoric, which is a talking point right out of the playbook of the most disgusting reactionaries that you meet in America. Like, this is disgusting, honestly. Like, somebody wrote this, thought it was a good idea, thought they were being edgy and making an interesting point, when really they were just being a fascist. It's important to talk about pop culture from the lens of political analysis, because whether we like it or not, all art is political. It's impossible to write a story or make a piece of art without imbuing it with little bits and pieces of your own assumptions about how the world works, including how the social world works. Human beings have always communicated our morals and values through stories. And for most people, our political ideology and our worldview is very strongly shaped by the media we consume growing up and the media we continue to consume as adults. That doesn't make us brainwashed sheep because the truth is nobody forms their political ideology in a vacuum. And anybody who tells you that, oh, I think independently, is a liar. Your political development is a profoundly social process, even if the only social interaction you're having in that process is reading articles and consuming art made by others. So it's important for us to talk about fictional stories and the messages that are contained therein. And it's important to talk about how we talk about them. Art is a major part of our social discourse. And the fact that somebody can watch and probably even enjoy a movie about overthrowing some of the worst reactionary oppression imaginable, fighting for an egalitarian world, the fact that they can watch that and come back with the idea that actually the reactionary police state were the good guys, I don't know, it's just, it just blows my mind. I gotta go to bed. I hate for this to be the last thing that I put into my brain before I go to sleep, but it's late. Tomorrow I gotta edit this motherfucker. Alright, good night, bitches.